Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're doing this virtual discussion um, uh, with Jeff Thomas, who's the artist of our current exhibition, which is our Contacts 2022 feature exhibition entitled, Where Are You From? Uh, I'm at the gallery in Toronto where you can see the exhibition through the middle of June. And uh, my friend here, Jeff Thomas, is at his home in Ottawa, uh, chiming in through the wonders of Zoom. Welcome, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. What I thought we would start to do is uh, walk through the, the exhibition a little bit, but um, I thought I'd start by just saying a few things, because you and I have known each other for a number of years now, and I have to say that I continue to be impressed by your work and how you're able to open dialogues, uh, really through your keen observations and asking questions as opposed to providing answers. And I find that dialogue very useful for someone like me, who's also trying to navigate these questions and uh, figure out how I factor into this world that we find ourselves living in. And one thing I noticed is um, how you continue to revisit previous projects. And I don't think it's out of a dissatisfaction with what you did previously, but again, with you continually asking questions, uh, how you're able to repurpose some work that you made years ago. And I remember when I saw, you know, cause we talked a, a fair bit about what you plan to exhibit, but when the prints were actually delivered, um, I was really amazed to see photographs that I thought I knew look completely different. Um, so I, I thought, you know, maybe, start at the beginning in a sense and you know maybe you could describe a bit of your experience uh, documenting downtown Buffalo and your first encounter with the question of where are you from? Yeah the, the um, well the, the I guess realistically looking at it in terms of what I was doing in the early years was a bit of street photography and that you know I had been uh, uh, impressed with the work of Eugene Ache and a lot of the social documentary photographers in that. And um, I just like the idea of what something looks like in a photograph. It was simple as that when I first began. So the politics of being indigenous in that um, didn't factor into my work for quite a few years after that. But in the beginning, what I wanted to do was to go back and record locations that I had seen as a kid. And one of the prime ones was uh, downtown Buffalo, New York. And at the time, when I started my work, it was going through a revitalization program. You know, it was kind of during that period of time when the steel industry collapsed and urban shopping malls opened up and that. And so the downtown was kind of gutted in a way. But what was interesting about it is that a lot of the old buildings were still standing at the time. And as I was working, some of those buildings were actually being torn down. But it was, but I think the idea of conversation entered into my, into my work. Um, as a part of it right from the beginning because I was photographing a building and I thought it was abandoned and I had photographed through the window and it looked like um, like a scene out of a 1930s movie. It was just amazing. It looked like people had just got up and left and didn't return. And uh, so I was photographing and after I finished, I started walking away and I heard somebody call out and they turned around and there was this old guy standing there. and. Um, Kind of funny to think now I'm an old guy, but uh, <laughs> it's just how it works out. But um, but he asked me what I was doing, and I told him that I was photographing the the windows there. And um, so you can imagine this building was gigantic, and it took up a whole block, and they had like um, storefronts at the bottom of the building at street level. And uh, he said, "Well, the boss wants to talk to you." So I was surprised and went, and the door buzzed, and we walked in. And inside is a photograph that, that's in the exhibition. Um, I was interested at that time um, in the idea of uh, what that city, what the city looked like early on, around the time that I was born in 1956. So these were structures and the kind of looking the people that were around at that time, it just was like a very interesting history of Buffalo. And it's, in any event, when I was inside, I realized that this was probably like a, a bookie joint. And, um, and so uh, I, I was standing there and I, the guy that owned a building or the shop said, um, what, I thought you were a cop. 
And I said, did you ever see a cop with hair down to his waist? And so he kind of said, no, but he said, and I said, can I take a photograph with you? And he said, no, he says, the, the cops have enough already. So I'm thinking to myself, man, what have I got myself into here? And uh, so it turned out that there was a man behind the counter and, um, and, uh, and I noticed that he looked indigenous. But, I, uh, but in any event, I was able to take a photograph. The, the boss asked the guys in the room, can, I, can this guy photograph in here? And I managed to get the boss in as well. So you'll see him kind of leaning over, the, um, over looking at the papers there on, on, the, um, on the bookcase. And, um, and so the guy behind the counter asked me, uh, where are you from? And uh, I wasn't quite sure how to answer because you know, I was born and raised in Buffalo. And that's what I told him. And then I realized that that's not the answer he wanted. I probably looked familiar to him. And he said, uh, no, he says, um, you know, where does your, where does your family come from? And so I told him it was the Six Nations of the Grand River. And he, and he asked me my father's name and he didn't recognize it. And then he asked, um, asked for my grandfather's name. And it turned out that he knew my grandfather. And the thing was, is that my grandfather had died uh, a couple of weeks before I was born. I was his first grandchild. He was a traditional man that spoke broken English, but um, he died at a very early age, uh, 49. And uh, so I made a connection there that was very interesting, but it raised another question of this idea of uh, what is the role for indigenous people living in urban centers, which had never been photo or really, I think, analyzed photographically and certainly not as a social aspect of the indigenous community. So I wanted to raise it as, um, as a part of my work. And also I had around the same time learned about the work of Edward Curtis. So if you can imagine these two dynamics of Ege on one side, Curtis on the other side, relatively working in the same period of time and both photographing vanishing cultures or mm -hmm. cities and that. And I thought, well, where do I stand in all of this? And so that's when I began thinking about uh, what the city meant to me and photographing it as an indigenous person, how would it look compared to Edward Curtis's photographs, the romanticized view of, of what had passed in the indigenous world. So that's the, how, the, how the question really began to emerge in my work. And, um, and that was the role that Buffalo had played in it. So my elder had told me uh, a long time ago when I was younger, she says, always talk about what you know. And so that was my role was to, she said, you have to have many life experiences before that. And so that's what I was doing was essentially um, experimenting with the camera and building my own archive. Mm -hmm. And then th that elder was at Emily, Jor Emily General? Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. yeah, and is I, that something, in, what I'm curious about, was it your, because you're self-taught as a photographer from what I remember. And so did you find that, you know, bringing what you were working on and discussing it with the elder, with your elders actually enhanced that relationship as well as brought you more in touch with your own heritage. I, I think you, that's a reasonable way of looking at, at the relationship that I had at that time. Um, I know that uh, what I was, see, I, when I used to go visit um, on weekends and holidays with my grandmother, I would talk to Emily about, she had been a school teacher uh, during her years. And um, I asked her about, well, how do, can, can the city and an indigenous, or I said Iroquois identity coexist in, you know, in an urban center? And uh, she couldn't answer that because she never lived in the city. But I found that uh, in retrospect, especially over the last couple of years, that I can see how many of the things that they showed and taught me and talked about have relevance to what I do in my work. Um, the conversation, for example, um, I never expected it in that building in Buffalo. But when I got outside and I stood on the street corner, I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, because it was the, un, um, you didn't expect it. And it turned into be something that was, um, that state is still just as vibrant in my imagination as it was in, in 1982. So, um, so yes, when I used to go to the reserve, there was something interesting about the juxtaposition of leaving Buffalo and then going on to the reserve on the gravel road, staying in a house that had no electricity, running water, any of the modern conveniences. So I had to be used other senses to entertain myself. And that's what they did is they built on that. And that's how I learned. And it seemed to have a very, um, 
I would say compatible relationship with what I was doing photographically. When I showed them the photographs or when I carried my camera around and they always thought, well, why are you photographing junk? Because, you know, it's an old farm and they had all kinds of equipment laying around in that. And I real and what I said is that it reminds me of my life here. And I compared that to say, let's just, what would an anthropologist collect? Who had been there um, in the early 20th century um, uh, photographing uh, people that, uh, ancestors. And, and it was interesting because um, that all came into play. What was I doing that was different from anthropology? What was I doing that was different from what existed photographically? And those were, I love the questions and I love the pursuit of the answers. And, and so that's how it all kind of, kind of worked in together. It was an interesting mashup, you know, in, in the late 1960s and 70s that I had to contend with, but, um, mm -hmm. but it still resonates. Yeah. Well, and one thing in terms of a match, uh, mashup, um, the uh, photograph that begins the exhibition, um, you know, shows how Toronto uh, had a role in your development. And also it contains, uh, I, I think it might be the first photograph that you took of your son Bear. Um, and, you know, maybe you could talk about, you know, what that photograph sparked. And also if you could talk a little bit about Bear is really emulating you as you're photographing him really as a surrogate of yourself. Mm, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a pretty good observation because uh, I've, often, I've often wondered about that because we look so similar in that and we're so much alike that, um, yeah, I think that, uh, and because I don't like to be photographed and he does or he doesn't mind, um, he, he has played that role for me. And, uh, but to, to get to the first part of your question is that um, I remember when I moved to Toronto, I think it was 1983, and um, uh, I was trying to carry on the same type of work that I did in Buffalo. But there were two things that, that were against it. First of all, I had no connection to Toronto like I did to Buffalo. And the second part was is that um, Toronto wasn't a post-industrial city. So it was very, very different architecturally in that. And the only places that I found that kind of interested me were was along Queen Street West and the Kensington Market. And uh, so one day I took my son, I took Bear down to uh, Queen Street West to go to the Silver Snail mm -hmm. to buy comic books. And if you look at the photograph very closely, you can see in his in his right hand, he has a, a plastic white bag, and that's where the comic books are. So anyways, we were coming, we, were, we came out and we we're waiting to cross the street. And I noticed um, the building there that had a tag on it, uh, Culture Revolution. And um, so I thought it'd be kind of, you know, interesting for Bear to have a memento of the day. And that was the first time that I photographed him like that. That was the first one that I made. And um, so, you know, it, it wasn't uh, a remarkable photograph when after I had taken, I thought it wasn't. But as I studied it, I began to see all of these different things emerging because he's wearing a baseball cap that has an Edward Curtis photograph on it, um, a photograph of a Cheyenne leader named Two Moons. And he had been in, in a number of battles, but most famously in the Battle of Little Bighorn. So there was kind of that revolution and, and you know, and two moons and, and my son, the brick wall kind of representing access to archives and information and wanting to know more and understand. And, um, and all the people and the noise on the streets, it was just a confluence of different um, sensory elements that that's kind of made me think about my work in a different way. I thought, well, I can't find the things to photograph that I want to here in Toronto. Um, and I'm looking at the photograph of Bear and I thought, what am I gonna teach him about living in the city? And so I realized that um, I couldn't do the type of work that, you know, like Walker Evans and others had done and that um, I had, I was, it, cause it just didn't fulfill uh, what I wanted or what I needed. And, and so that's what the photograph did. It led me to, to the idea that I had to intervene with my own story into the urban narrative or the urban fabric. And so that's how the work began. And about two years later, uh, my wife and I split up and I moved to Winnipeg and I stopped working for about uh, three years uh, 
to find the inspiration that I needed. So I thought denying myself my camera and living in a city where I only knew one person, that's what it did. Mm -hmm. So it really set me off in, in terms of, um, of, of having to find that alternative voice and, uh, and to not compromise. So Bear came out to visit me one about, uh, I think it was 1989 or 1990. And that's when I realized that it was time to move back to Ontario. So I had found what I was looking for and, and what I wanted to photograph. And so that's why that photograph is so important. Mm -hmm. And then you continue to work on that, obviously. Like, I can't remember how many portraits comprise the Bear portfolio by this stage. There's 22 now. I, I, I didn't want to abuse our relationship, you know. Yeah. And it was interesting because there was one point I came to Toronto for, for a meeting and I came outside, told Bear to meet me out at this location. I came out and he was sitting across the street and there was a billboard that had a big Indian head on it and he was standing right next to it. And then he said, well, Dad, I wanted to make sure you saw it, and, um, and so, uh, so I saw it and I photographed him uh, next to it as well. And, and the, the same thing with the other photograph in the exhibition of uh, uh, Bearable Revealed, or not Bearable, um, oh, I forgot his name now, uh, but he's a Lakota man from the, from the uh, 19th century. And, um, and we were walking down an alley in Toronto, which I guess now is, is um is, it has a name now of uh oh, where uh, other videos yes okay yeah. yeah and that's kind of in the same location where i made that first bear portrait mm -hmm. and i didn't know it at the time and then when i was photographing you see nana bush rules on the back and nana bush is that indigenous kind of trickster uh character and that's why i photographed him in that location and then he pulled up his shirt and he was wearing, and on his t-shirt, he had a reproduction of another Edward Curtis photograph. It's just synchronicity and, and how it all unfolded. But my first time back in Toronto was kind of like that time when I photographed him in 84. So um, yeah, Bear has certainly been kind of my stand-in in that way. To, and I didn't want to photo, go around photographing indigenous people to make my point, because I felt like that was too easy to do. I wanted mm -hmm. to do something that was more complex. So that's, yeah, it was almost like a mirror. <laughs> Bear was my mirror. And, uh, yeah, I can see that. And in terms of another sort of complex project that you have continued to add to over the years, um, thinking about the series Scouting for Indians and Indians on Tour, um, do you want to talk about the idea and the execution behind those series? Yeah, two of the photographs in the exhibition represent those two series. So the first one is a cigar store Indian that I photographed, I think on McCall Street near the AGO. Yeah, that's it exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and so I, hadn't, I never used that photograph. And then when I was looking, working on this exhibition, I thought, well, this is a good place to use it because I talked a bit about Toronto being the center part of the beginning of the work. And, um, and so, it's, uh, so that's from the series Scouting for Indians. And that series emerged um, from looking up at bank press, like the Bank of Montreal, Toronto Dominion Bank and that. And then just, you know, looking and uh, looking for others like statues, monuments, um, anything that I could find that represented some sort of indigenous aspect. And uh, so it was surprising how many I began to find once I, just, once I knew what I was looking for. And, um, and so that's what I did for, for a number of years was, um, was scouting for Indians and everywhere we traveled. And I remember Bear, we were sitting in a car one time driving and uh, we were going through this small town and I, I stopped and I said, look, there's the old bank of Montreal. And he was surprised how I was able to, you know, how to find these places all the time, you know, like they were always popping up. But, um, and then uh, Bear was living with me in Ottawa and um, he was moving out to Vancouver Island. And so I kind of, I was losing my muse in a way, and, but I got a box in the mail and, um, 
inside were the uh, plastic Indians and cowboys that Ali Kazmi had used for the film he made about my work, uh, Shooting Indians, uh, Journey with Jeff Thomas. And uh, with a little note that said, you'll probably find something more interesting to do with these. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so what I did is I took the first one out, which is represented in the exhibition. And there's some um, uh, statue of an Indian, Indian hunter kneeling with a bow and arrow um, in front of a street corner near Parliament Hill. And uh, that was the beginning of, um, of Indians on tour. And I like the idea of using a stereo, stereotypical figure that most people would be familiar with, raising questions about how to feel about this place in the everyday world. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to show uh, and to represent the negative and positive aspects that this was an indigenous photographer that was kind of producing this work, what were the reasons for doing that? And why would you use, you know, a plastic Indian like that? Mm -hmm. And um, and then I know that I've heard people say that looking at the photographs, they never know whether to smile or cry. Exactly. That, you know, and um, and actually, I think that I had heard that comment um, from somebody uh, in Toronto one time, I think. But, uh, but it was interesting because that really uh, was an example of what I wanted the work to be able to do. But it was based initially on the Buffalo Bill Wild West shows. I had seen photographs from the Denver Public Library, uh, Buffalo Bill's tour in Europe, and they showed uh, Lakota chiefs um, in gondolas and, 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 you know, palaces and things like that. And I thought that was just an incredible juxtaposition. And I wondered what those Lakota men talked about when they were there and riding mm. on the gondola and that. And of course, you know, there, there may be some information somewhere, but I've never found it. But, um, but it's that idea of thinking about um, what these, why are you photographing that, sir? I mean, that's what people would come up to me sometimes and say, and I'd say, well, I'm, you know, uh, photographing this building, you look up here and you see these two Indians up there and, and that, and that was, um, that's you know, how it began to unfold in terms of, and I think, you know, it, it was also looking at building an archive. I never looked at like my powwow work or, or the bear portraits or any of the series that I had done as, as full bodied series, like the powwow. I've had, I had offers from dancers to travel with them around the country and that, and, I didn't do it because I had, within a short period of time, collected the information that I needed. And mm -hmm. then I put it, I assemble it and then store it and wait yeah. for the time that I can actually begin to, to write that story. And, and when you think about things like the powwow now, you, I look at it in juxtaposition to what, we're, what we've learned about residential schools. And I ask the question, um, would that have been allowed to take place at a residential school or to look at photographs of you know indigenous people all of these things wouldn't have been available to those kids so how does it resonate today in terms of uh, finding agency for it in terms of self-determination and recovery from that uh, from the residential school history so mm -hmm. um, yeah so that's how these how these series began to unfold well and one thing that i find interesting about the evolution of scouting for Indians is originally I always interpreted that as being, you know, you reclaiming that space and um, taking authority over the imagery. Um, and now with a lot of that imagery being eradicated, um, it's much more anthropological for me in terms of these are now historical artifacts as evidence of things that are now vanishing. You know, and so it's mm -hmm. keeping that history active and alive and uh, remaining part of the conversation instead of just trying to forget all about what happened in the past. Yeah. Yeah. So it's little reminders because when you grow up, this is what I really want to convey to my audience is that what it feels like to grow up as an Indigenous person in the city and not have access to, to your own history. To think about how much knowing your own history empowers you is just an amazing thing like buffalo had in the, in the uh towards the end of the american civil war or um, revolutionary war had been uh turned into the area became the buffalo creek reservation which was a point where a lot of the people that like uh joseph brant and them who had lost their land 
um, moved west and settled in that area. And so this uh, reservation became like a, a relocation center in a way. And that's when my ancestors moved up to Canada and the other half of the Confederacy stayed in New York State. So um, how does that empower uh, children uh, to have that history available to them? So, and you don't get to that point without thinking and provoking. And I remember, you know, being in grade school and asking how come we don't learn about our own history? And I had an African-American teacher who told me, she says, well, you're gonna have to find that out for yourself. And I, I was kind of dismayed with the answer, but eventually I began to understand what she was trying to tell me about having to find that because nobody's going to teach you that. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this, it's, I found that it's really, it's been really important to keep track of all of those insights that I gained when I was growing up as well, because they have come back to be a part of my work. Mm -hmm. Well, and one thing it, I think that leads us into, you know, talking a little bit about the most recent work, because I think it's been a number of years that you've been talking about incorporating the Wampum into the work. And I think you figured it out after such a long time. And um, by using that format and reconfiguring and bringing together a lot of these uh, projects into um, one cohesive statement is the way that I'm reading a lot of these newer pictures. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah. Um... It, it's been a long process um, uh, going through that. It, it started around 1996 when I began looking at using a wampum belt as a format for, for my work. I began, you know, my career is, began with this idea of, you know, I don't see or think the way that photographs are generally displayed in a book or in a gallery. It, I, you know, I enjoy looking at them, but there's something there that doesn't it really doesn't stick for me. And I, and that's, so that's what I was really looking for was putting myself in the position of figuring out how do I indigenize all these photographs that I've accumulated. And so, um, so when I figured it out and using the, um, the wampum belt format, and it was an amazing experience because I felt like I had learned how to write for the first time. And they were just one, if, I think I produced, I have about a hundred now mm -hmm. and I have plans for about another 25. And, um, and so this is the portfolio. This is the work that I, I dreamed about in the 1980s of being able to do. And it was just an amazing feeling to feel like I, I, I could write and tell my story. And I think that it, it also plays with the idea that, um, that sometimes people might not get the, the disparate type of images that are that are in this rectangular uh, framework, but um, but that's the other part of it. It's an ongoing project now where I'm starting to write the stories for each one and record them as well. So it's it hasn't reached its end yet, and this has all been purposeful. I wanted to have a long career. I thought if I have a long life, I want to have a long career and see how it unfolds decade after decade, and that's essentially how it's been. So with this new work. Um, it's continuing to evolve. And I'll tell you the last one that I'm really anxious to, to work on now is I was looking at a photograph that was made uh, by this uh, photographer. I don't know if you heard of her, Gertrude Casebier. Case oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, so she photographed uh, uh, Lakota performance from Buffalo Bill's Wild West show in her studio. And um, I was able to download uh, most of them from the Library of Congress. And I started retouching them, you know, cleaning them up and added a bit. And I noticed that uh, most of the performers from Buffalo Bill's show were uh, photographed sitting in, next to a window. And of course, we know why, because that's where the best light was coming in. But when I was thinking about and looking at the picture of the guy, I thought, I wonder what he's thinking about. What is it like to be in New York City and there's Broadway and they had just marched down it in a parade with all these people looking at them. And so he's kind of looking out the window. And so I started looking for a photograph uh, from a, the relatively same time, about 1900 in the same area with people on the street. And I'm gonna juxtapose that photograph with the one uh, in the studio. And it's just like, it, sometimes it just gives me chills to think about you know, the capacity of that image mm -hmm. to take you where, you know, where it hasn't gone before, because I've never seen anything like that. But that's what's coming up next is doing more work like that. But, but this is what I mean, it, you know, it, it starts and it continues to grow and it's, you know, it's still growing. And, um, 
And so that's why I don't have any plans for, for uh, new work right now. It's just, I'm still enjoying working on these. Oh, I can understand why. <laughs> um, well, I'll let you go now that I hope people have an opportunity to see the work in person, but if you don't, hopefully this little presentation has given you a bit of a, a taste of what Jeff Thomas has been up to and what we're so privileged to show here. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Jeff, real pleasure.